This is The Secret Library, a podcast about writing and publishing books. I'm Caroline Donahue, a life coach who works with writers, and I'm here to tell you this is your year. It's time to stop waiting and start writing. The Secret Library podcast is brought to you by listeners like you. Learn how you can support the show, get access to custom Q&As and solo episodes with me at patreon.com slash secret library. This is episode 144 of the Secret Library podcast. My guest this week is Jacqueline Winspear, who was born and raised in the county of Kent, England. She spent the early part of her career working in academic publishing, in higher education, and in marketing communications in the UK. In 1990, she emigrated to the US and embarked upon a lifelong dream to be a writer. She subsequently became a regular contributor to journals covering international education and travel, and has published articles in the Washington Post, Huffington Post, the Daily Beast, and other publications. Jacqueline's grandfather was severely wounded and shell-shocked at the Battle of the Somme in 1916. And it was, as she understood the extent of his suffering, that even in childhood, Jacqueline became deeply interested in the war to end all wars and its after effects. Though she did not set out to write a war novel as such, it came as no surprise that this part of history formed the backdrop of her fiction. Jacqueline's first novel, Maisie Dobbs, was a national bestseller and received an array of accolades, including New York Times Notable Book 2003, a Publishers Weekly Top Mystery 2003, and a Book Sense Top 10 selection. In addition, the novel was nominated for seven awards, including the Edgar for Best Novel, only the second time a first novel was nominated in this category. She has since written 14 novels in the series, as well as the standalone novel, The Care and Management of Lies. The American Agent, the most recent Maisie Dobbs novel, is out now. In addition to What Would Maisie Do?, a treasury of quotes and inspiration that has served as a guidepost for so many readers, including me. I have loved Maisie Dobbs ever since um, I first discovered the series many years ago. And I think I've read every single one, including the most recent one. So it was a great joy to talk to Jacqueline Winspear, who has managed to take a mystery novel and turn it into something so much more. Um, This character grows and evolves over time and deals with situations in life that sometimes feel frighteningly familiar in, in difficult times that we face now. And there is something so reassuring about watching her navigate these difficult situations with grace and integrity um, that I think brings readers so much more than that. So it was such a great joy to speak to Jacqueline and to learn about how she approaches these novels. And I know you're going to love hearing from her. I just was delighted with this conversation and I'm very, very happy to share it with you now. So here we are with Jacqueline Winspear. Hi, Jacqueline. Thank you so much for coming on the show. Well, thank you for inviting me. It's really a delight to be here. And how exciting that we have not one, but two books to discuss. And I want to discuss both of them. But I'd love to start with The American Agent, just because I think we can get into this wonderful character, Maisie Dobbs, who has been uh, a friend to so many. I think she is one of those characters that feels like a friend. She's definitely felt that way to me since she first came out. And I wonder how it is for you to have a relationship with a character over time as a writer and what it's been like to watch her go through her life and many quite challenging situations throughout the course of her mm-hmm. life, not just through her cases, but as a, as a person herself. Well, you know, that's a, an interesting question because that it was uh, the way I structured the series was, was not an accident. Um, I mean, the first book was an accident in every sense of the word, because I, I wrote it while recovering, most of it while recovering from a, an accident. And I had at that point, I did not expect to be writing a series because I had this idea in my head and it was a story that I wanted to tell. So I sat down to write it and I didn't think it would be a series. Um, fortunately, while I was writing, when ideas came to me or a scene came to me that I thought, oh, that doesn't quite fit. Instead of just dumping it or something, I put it in a little file and I'm going somewhere with this, I, a little file marked fragments. And so anyway, I wrote Maisie Dobbs. And then when the book went into production, my then editor called me and said, well, Jackie, let's talk about the next book in the series. And I thought, 
oh dear. <laughs> and it was, there's someone at the door, you know, and I, let me call you later. I mean, I literally tap danced my way through the conversation, which wasn't really a conversation. And I thought, what am I going to do? So I quickly opened up that file, fragments, and I printed every paragraph. Literally, there were about, you know, eight paragraphs that I'd thrown in there and put them on the floor. And I moved them around. And I thought, I realized I had just a speck just the speck of an idea for each one of about six more stories. Wow. And I thought then, okay, so I have a chance here to do something really interesting for me as well as perhaps readers. And I realized that I wanted there to be an arc of the series, not just an arc for each book. And I wanted my characters to grow and change through time. I wanted to see how they were impacted, not only by what they were doing, i.e., the case in that particular book, that particular story, but how they were impacted by the events of their day, because we're all impacted by the events of our day on a local and in, even international basis and so on. And how that felt, and more than anything, I knew that I wanted to find out how does it feel to be a woman who has gone through one war at a very impressionable age and then later faces another war? How does that feel? And, and the wonderful thing about having a series character, and of course there are, I think sometimes there are restrictions, but is that it's, to me, it was more organic. So for, let me give you an example. If you meet someone at a party and you get on with them and you think, oh, you know, this one, you know, I really like this person. And then you meet for coffee later and then you go for a hike and then, and you get to know a person over time and you reveal yourselves to each other over time. It doesn't all happen at once. So for me, that process of creating a character over time, she revealed, revealed herself to me as much as I created the character. So it was more like a natural process. I learned more as I went along. And it was really interesting when An Incomplete Revenge came along. There was an aspect of her background that I knew but I didn't know enough. She hadn't revealed enough to me. And so that was where I really began to get into her, her background, that, that gypsy part of her heritage. Mm. And, you know, it's just like, you know, you go to that party, you meet someone, then you've known them for five months and they say, you know what, there's something I really need to tell you about myself, you know, <laughs> and something comes out. And so it was, it was, it's a very organic process. And I, I really enjoy learning more about the character as uh, and creating the character as time goes on and and watching not just Maisie Dobbs but Billy Beale, Priscilla and how everybody you know there, there's there's more to them that meets the eye but you don't know it all at once no i think i think that's the compelling thing about writing a series absolutely I think it's compelling to read as well because of a choice that you made. And I actually heard you speak about this once and I it struck me then and it still does reading forward that when reading historical fiction, sometimes people fall in love with a particular era and mm -hmm. then you'll have this situation, which is kind of strange, where a character is like perpetually in 1928 or something yeah. like, like, yeah. oh, I just really love the fashion. I love everything about this. So this character is just going to do 250 cases in 1928 and we're just never going to get out of it. Whereas, I never want to. Yeah. yeah, and clearly not, because we start with with Maisie, you know, we know a bit of her past when she's in service and then her life as a nurse in World War One. And now reading the current book, The American Agent, we're up into the blitz of World War Two. So that's a lot of ground that you've covered together. Mm -hmm. And one thing I always wondered was when you have an idea for the next book, do you pick an event like the Blitz to frame it? Or does the idea come first and then it becomes clear at what point in history we've gotten to? I've generally got an idea of the, not particularly an event, but the time. Mm. And, and that was an important point you brought up because what I didn't want to do, and I made my mind up very early on, I didn't want to create a series where everything could have happened in the same day and the same year. Because, I mean, you know, I mean, let's face it, that's impossible. I mean, how many serious cases can someone handle in a year or whatever? And it's, it's you know, it's, you, 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 it, it just didn't seem realistic to me. But um, 
But then there is saying, well, I want to move this on six months or I want to move this on a year. And not only am I looking and I look to see what is happening around that time, because how, it also frames how conversations happen. You know, Billy Beal walking into the office with his newspaper, slaps it down, says, you'll never guess what. This woman has just flown all across, all the way to Australia. You know, how's that for bravery or whatever, you know, or there's a commentary on it, which give immediately frames it in its time. It's, this is the sort of thing that's happening now, you know. Um, and I, And then there are events, for example, I mean, her being in, Gibraltar in a dangerous place at about the time of the Spanish Civil War. I knew I wanted her to, I actually always wanted her to be in Gibraltar at some point because I had been to Gibraltar and I, I really thought it would be an interesting, I've been there a couple of times, interesting backdrop for a story. And it just so happened, it just fitted in that moment that she would be there. So I was able to weave in this whole experience of being at war again and how it, it helped her healing. So so it's it's a question of yes and no. You know, I don't particularly pick an event, but I do have to look at what is happening at the time when I want to set the next book. Yes. So, you know, so, so I can weave in the event and it might be a big event. It might be a small event. It might not be an event. It might just be what's going on, you know. Yeah, absolutely. I think that's just something that's been noteworthy to me as a reader, following her as she goes through this. And as a small note, I do love the fact that there are references to the other cases going on in the books and that it feels like a real business between the three of them with Sandra yeah. and and that they're saying, well, we have these other cases and they're just dying to have something a bit more exciting when it comes up. And you have the sense of the other things that they're working on, which mm. I think builds the relationship between the reader and the characters themselves. Um, for those listening, if you haven't read them yet, you'll get very attached to these people. <laughs> well, I mean, that's realistic. I mean, let's face it. If you're working in, for example, an ad agency, you you know, and, and, and you're a small business. And, and I, I used to have a small business years ago. You know, you have a couple, you have suddenly you have a big new client come in. And it's like, oh, God, we've all got to get stuck into this one. But, you know, you can't leave the bread and butter behind. You know, there's this one, this that needs to happen to happen that and, and people you have to pay attention to the other aspects of the business so there is reference to for example in the american agent you know billy happens to observe something i'm not going to say what well, when he's going to visit this old lady that had an elderly lady that contacted them because she was convinced you know that people were getting into her house while she was in this down in the shelter and things like that you know so it, they help it they, they've got the other smaller cases and they don't leave them behind because it's, it's bread and butter, you know, and it's also important, you know, it's a business. It's not a, just a, a, a one-stop shop for one important case every now and again. Yes. <laughs> so with this building with the relationship, one thing that I've wondered about as well is that these characters have extremely difficult lives, all of them at varying points. I can't think of anyone in the book who hasn't faced something really difficult. So I'm wondering how it is for you as a writer to have these characters you've become incredibly attached to and, and having to write them through incredible loss, pain, often injury, um, things that were very painful being brought up again to mind through the course of working on these cases. How is it to be inside of those kinds of experience with so many characters, particularly due to the period in history when all of this is taking place? It's, it's not always easy. I'll tell you that. Um, and I'm reflecting on the things that happen to people. It's, that's life. You know, I mean, we're talking about eras, you know, if you go earlier on, I'm not going to give any spoilers here, but, you know, um, one in five ch children died before a certain age, you know, and you had, um, you know, the, the uh, a first world war, the aftermath of that war, there were industrial accidents because there, you know, we live in a time when there's a lot of, um, equipment, for example, in a factory that stops you chopping off your finger or whatever, but you, you didn't have that in those days. Um, and, uh, you know, people had, uh, car accidents because they were, your cars were different. I mean, all these things that people go through and plus illness and so on. And then, you know, the, uh, the first world war followed by the great depression, followed by the rise of uh, fascism, and, uh, you know, then the Second World War. So you're, you're, it's tumultuous. 
tumultuous times, out of which came a lot of good. So what does that do to me as a writer? Because during the time I'm writing, I'm immersed in a lot of the time a very dark place. And I must admit, through this, I think this book in particular, or going to the Second World War, I'm very much drawing upon very immediate family memories as well, my parents' memories. Particularly, my, you know, say my mother, who, well, actually both parents, but I think my mother t- took it slightly differently, um, her experiences of being evacuated in the war, which, which was not pleasant at all. And, um, you know, being bombed out of a house, seeing people killed every day. And there was this very much keep calm and carry on. In fact, one of the oh, – part of the opening scene – where um, in The American Agent, and I'm not giving too much away, where um, Catherine Saxon, the war correspondent, is out with Maisie and Priscilla, and she observes something happening. That was directly based upon something my aunt saw. And um, so revisiting that, it, it's – it's almost as if it's 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 you're re- revisiting a dark place in family history. The while there were definitely there was that keep calm and carry on spirit, you know there was also the wound. It's like it, it's how can I put it? It's um, it's almost it, wounds that become part of family mythology. So when I finished it, and it was really interesting because it was whilst it was last year when I was in London. And I uh, was working not only on Maisie Dobbs, but also um, what would Maisie do? And I was very ill while I was there. And I was asked to write a short story for an anthology. And I thought to myself, I cannot write the sort of thing that people expect me to write. And I wrote a comedy. Hmm. And the reason I wrote a comedy was because I had to break the darkness. As a, because I had been immersed in a dark period um, that is not without its lightness, but it's a dark period of time. Does that answer that question for you? Yes, absolutely. I think, I think and I, you know, it's it's one that's only been asked of me a couple of times. Um, but I think, I think, you know, if you're, often if you're writing mystery anyway, if you look at the, the archetypal journey that mystery is. It is a journey through chaos to resolution. And if you are writing that, you have to be in that maelstrom of chaos with your characters. So, and it's not always easy to suddenly say, okay, I'm going to go downstairs and have a sandwich for lunch now, you know, (laughs) and it's a bright sunny day in California and you're leaving behind chaos (laughs) and, you know, you take it with you (laughs) and get indigestion. (laughs) Yes. So, so you have to be prepared for that. And I, I, and, uh, and and sometimes there's an antidote, and I, I think that's why sometimes people write things that are nothing to do with, let's say, the work that they're known for as kind of an antidote. It's almost like their commercial break. I mean, I write a lot of articles now as well, articles and essays and so on, and on completely different subjects. And it's it it gets me out of the dark place. Yes. Yeah, I just, I wondered about that because it feels so immersive. The history is so well articulated. Like you really feel the experience of being in the Blitz, which is something, of course, we all study and we all know about. But there was something about reading this book and thinking about this dichotomy of people going down into the shelters and then coming out and having to just go straight to work or people getting trapped somewhere, you know, being in the middle of a conversation, losing track of time, and then having to just go into a bomb shelter there and not being able to get home. And all of those details that really brought it to life for me in a way that I hadn't seen before. So I'm, I'm wondering what kind of research you're doing in addition to family history to just get all of this copious amount of detail so clear on the page. I, I actually come from a very big extended family. Mm. My mom was one of 10 kids. And um to put it like, I mean, put it like this, almost every theater of war was experienced by someone in my family. And whilst people don't readily tell their stories, I have listened to stories and I know the family stories. And for example, I know my aunts reading my work. It's actually, um, it's it's reminded them of of what they went through or not, you know, it's always with you if you go through something, but then they'll phone me and uh, one of them will phone me and tell me something that I didn't know. And, 
it adds to my knowledge and understanding, but I also watch documentaries. I spend, I've spent a lot of time at the Imperial War Museum in London, which is a, I think it's the most brilliant museum of social history for anybody who ever goes to, 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 to London. It's, it's absolutely brilliant in terms of social history and it's not all just sort of war games or anything like that. Um, and, uh, and, and of course I read and, but I, it's it's really interesting because of the uh, I'll be quite honest because of the relationship I had with my mother and the way she told me about the war I had a I think I had a very as deep an understanding as you can have without actually going through something um, and you know it's it's interesting I mean I was visiting one of my aunts just last year and uh, she was telling me how. You know, and this is the sort of little nugget that as a writer, you think I'm taking that and I will do something with that. I don't know what I'm going to do with it yet, but I will do something with it. It goes back into your little bank of possibilities. I love that. The idea of a bank of possibilities. And she was telling me how there was a sudden bombing raid. She was a child. They were back in London from evacuation for, for some reason. A lot of children came back during what they called the phony war. And there was a sudden bomb attack. Luftwaffe attack and she ran into the cellar and apparently you know no one, and she said she cowered down and all she could hear was the shrapnel hitting the the, the trash cans outside the metal dustbins and, and she was terrified and she said your mum came down to find me well my mum could have only been about 12 at the time your mum came down to find me you know she was probably a bit older so backtrack she said your mum came down to find me she grabbed my hand and she said don't worry I'll get you to the shelter. And she took her sister's hand and ran with her to the shelter. And she said they had to run. And she said all they could hear was the, the, the shrapnel hitting things and trying not to get hit by the shrapnel as it was bouncing off walls and so on because, of, you know, lots of shrapnel from a bomb. And uh, and then going into the shelter. And so that's the sort of the, the thing that you draw upon. And, uh, and, and certainly, you know, my dad as well. My dad's experience is uh, – inspired to die but once um mm. but as i say it's it's like the this little it's almost like this little those it's it's not always the big broad brush history i'm looking for i'm looking for those little those experiences that tell what it's like to be a human being in this situation what it's what you see around you i want to get inside the character's heads and i want to show through their eyes what they see at this moment, you know, and it's it's the little things that often are, are the, the give the biggest impact. I have found, and for me as a writer, they give the biggest impact for me as a writer. And um, I just want to go back a bit to perhaps explain that a bit more. Um, uh, in, in the early days of writing this series, I went to um, the battlefields of World War One twice. I, mm. I made two two or three excursions there, and spent a lot of time on my own in quiet spaces, walking around places. And, and my constant question was, how would I feel if, and I had gone to, um, there's a scene in pardonable lies where Maisie Dobbs goes to a casualty clearing station cemetery. There is a very specific type of cemetery, a war cemetery. And I went to one and I stood there in this driving rain, in Belgium at a casualty clearing station cemetery. And what I had to say to myself was, how would I feel if, and that's a crucial question, I think for a writer, how would I feel if, and my, how would I feel if was, if in my, you know, years later, I was returning to a place where as a girl of a very impressionable age, I saw death of a, of a most terrible kind. And as I stood there in the driving rain, I thought I would fall to my knees because I would not be able to stand up anymore. And later I, I was able to write that, that scene into Pardonable Lies. And uh, I won't say any more because in case any people have not read that book. <laughs> but it, and, and having written that scene, I then had to just go for a nice long walk because it just, I just felt it, it in such a visceral way in my heart. And that's another thing I think, you know, you write from the heart. Definitely. Well, that yeah. brings me to some thoughts, which is that clearly in writing from the heart, you created a character that started to resonate with people very, very quickly, winning awards for the books from the beginning. And then 
people loved Maisie Dobbs so much that they started to write to you um, about their experiences reading her and the relationship they were building with her. Almost like, I think you said, like she was a big sister or some other important character, um, Mm -hmm. which inspired the creation of What Would Maisie Do? And I'm wondering if you could say a little bit about how that relationship evolved and how the readers started to respond to her and get in touch with you about what they thought of her and what she meant to them? Um, It started quite early on and it was a a real surprise to me in that I started getting um, emails and letters saying that people expressing the fact that they were keeping little notebooks perhaps of Maisie's they would say, oh, Maisie's wisdom. Maisie's saying, I want to keep, you know, and, and there was something that um, Morris Blanche said that re- Maisie's mentor that really resonated with me. And here's why. And they would give me, tell me a family story or something, a personal experience. And I kept getting uh, people saying, well, when are you going to publish a book of Maisie's sayings? And I thought, I'm never going to do that. <laughs> that's not, gonna, that's not, I don't have enough material for that. And um, and so this one, and I, uh, people would share with me a lot of uh, quite heartrending personal stories, um, particularly people who had suffered through war who, or who were, had a family member who had suffered through war. And, um, and, and I started to think ages ago, well, maybe one day I'll do something about that. And it was really interesting how, and this phrase came up from people from the east coast to the west coast and places in between people would often say to me you know I often think to myself what would Maisie do and and which is really lovely um and then it was um oh gosh it was in I let me think February 2017 uh is it round about that time um I was inspired to do something and there was a catalyst for that inspiration and that was the passing of someone that I, uh, um, Amy Krause Rosenthal, who was also represented by the same literary agent. And uh, so I knew very, I knew of her work, I knew of her, I never had actually met her, but such a creative person. And it was very sad when she passed, but she had this wonderful, you can go to the website, The Beckoning of Lovely. And it was, it, it just, and I thought, gosh, I really want to do something creative. And it was, she totally inspired me. And I thought, I'm going to do something with what would Maisie do? I, and I just immediately had this vision of a book that would not only have um, readers' favorite passages from the book, but it would have um, my interpretation. This is what inspired me to to write that piece. And here's a question for you. This is a question that Maisie Dobbs might ask you and plus have journaling pages. And I saw it as having sections on, um, you know, the places that are featured in the books because people are always asking me, oh, so, so, you know, where would Chelstone be? And what would, you know, Chelstone Manor look like? And what does this look like? And, and so on. And also things like why, um, you know, a, a, a section on why clothing, for example, is important in historical fiction. It's not just because I happen to like clothes. It's to do with establishing time and place. So I saw this as being a wonderful, um, not only an accompaniment to the series, but it, it, it becomes a living document so that the reader can become complete, much more engaged with the series and engaged with being part of Maisie's life in a different way, even if they've never read the books, because... <laughs> You don't actually have to have read the books to be part of this book. And uh, so anyway, how it started, I literally put out a call to readers and said, I've got an idea what your favorite, you know, passages are. But, you know, could you let me know your favorite passages? And I picked, I think, the best 28 because there's only so many you can pick in, the top 28. And uh, because I also had these other sections, plus it's filled with artwork and so on. And I wrote a piece uh, about each of those um, sections from the book. And I made up a mock, what would Maisie do? And I, the history is I showed it to my agent and she, well, that's an interesting idea. And then she showed it to my editor. So that's an interesting idea. And it went to a different department at my publishers and they said, Oh, we can do something with this. And what would Maisie do was born. And I'm, I'm really thrilled about it. It's being published at the same time as the American agent. Yeah. It's turned out so beautifully. And I think that, 
I wonder how it feels to write a character that sort of becomes, you know, I mean, ideally you hope that your characters become a real person that's independent from you. But I wonder how it is when you write this character on an ongoing basis, knowing how many people are invested in her. And does that change? Does it make you feel a certain amount of pressure or is it comforting? I just wonder how it is knowing that all these people are thinking, oh, Maisie, I must know what she's doing. <laughs> um, it, it actually isn't pressure. And I have no pressure to create her in a certain way to, to meet sort of reader expectations or something, because everybody expects something slightly different anyway. Um, I just, you know, I just let the character speak to me, you know, and, and it's really interesting how, how, she, gosh, this is going to sound a bit weird, but it's almost like she does speak to me at times, even when, you know, maybe I'm, I'm finished a book and I think, Oh, I'm going to take a bit of a breather here. Suddenly something will come to me. It's like this voice in my head and I think, Oh, please could you give me a break. <laughs> <You know? laughs> Just let, let me think about something else for a while. And it's, and, and it's, it almost is, um, it's, it, it's, it's sort of, I know there's a point at which after I have finished a book that I know what needs to happen next in her personal life. So that's, really part of the arc of the story. I know what she wants to have happen deep inside her, even though she might not admit it. I know where, where she would like her life to go. I mean, there's the whole element of, um, you know, what happens in the American age. And so a lot happens personally to Maisie Dobbs. Yes. And that's really important. You can't, I think when you have characters, not just the main character, but the, all the, the other characters. And I feel like I have, and this perhaps is, is, is sums it up in that, as much as I have a quote unquote mystery series, I'm, I've also created and I'm, I'm creating a what you could call as a, a traditional family saga. It's it's all the characters are going somewhere and doing something in their lives, and and the, but it's it's like a, a repertory troupe. They they they're, they're together, and each one has to have a story, and their stories intertwine, and they care about each other, and that sometimes they they don't care about each other. <laughs> you know, it's like life. You know. Um, and, and, you know, I think in this, in the American agent, we, we really see them very much engaged with each other. And if you reflect back on to die, but once, you know, uh, both Billy and Priscilla, I mean, Maisie, she almost can't help either of them because of what is happening with, with their families, but she's very, very worried because of what is coming to pass with the war. And the fact that both those people that are very close to her have sons of, of soldiering age. You know, yeah, and the say, fear that that brings up for all of them. I yeah. think that was something that's. I don't know if you knew from the beginning that you would end up writing all the way through to World War II and into this, but there is such an element of oh, not only you, have they seen this before, but we've seen them see it before, which is sort of doubly, mm -hmm. doubly meaningful as a reader and I'm sure as a writer as well. Mm -hmm. You know, it's funny, but um, I always. I always knew where I was going and, and, um, or I, I knew I, I could see this in the distance where, where I was headed and gosh, I think it was someone wrote a review. It was roundabout book four. It was, I think it was messenger of truth when we first start to see the rise of fascism and that's when it, and uh, someone said, well, that's it. She dealt with Hitler and that's it. You know, well, isn't that great that you can finish that in one book? And I thought, you just are not hanging around long enough. You know, <laughs> <laughs> give me, it didn't all happen in one day, you know, and it, it's because I knew there was going to be more. I was just, that was just the start. <laughs> right. There would be more. And, uh, you know, it, it, it's, it's really, it's really interesting. I mean, I thought it was kind of funny at the time. Well, you know, it's, this is a series, and in a series, you don't let it all out at once because then you've just got a big fat novel. You know, right. um, you've got a blockbuster, and I wasn't. I'm not. I, I don't. I'm not publishing blockbusters. I'm publishing a series. I'm publishing. You know that I'm writing um, an overall journey for for the characters, and that means an overall journey for um, in terms of history. And, uh, and, and it's that just like each book has a spotlight on a certain time, you know, through the people. 
It also, I mean, in that moment, I think that makes a lot of sense. Like, yeah, we've all dealt with fascism in that one moment. Of course, that doesn't happen. But in a sense, I think people hope that in the moment. Like, oh, we've gotten through that bit. Hopefully it won't get any worse. Because obviously the characters don't know what's coming next, even though everyone reading does, because we're looking back. But they're living it forward in their actual lives. I think actually the it's touching upon tumultuous times in fiction and in a series. And I will say particularly, I think, that the historical mystery. I think one of the things that draws people to it, and it's a, it's a very popular literary form, is that it gives a level of comfort, and here's why. In that you see characters that you grow to love. And there are, I read books and there are characters that I grow, I've grown to love. And you see them go through this journey, through chaos to resolution. And they're still there at the end. And you see them going through this tumultuous time in history, which you know has happened and we all came through it. And there's the key. We all came through it. And when you are living in tumultuous times, and there is no way that our time cannot be described as, you know, tumult, it's pretty tumultuous. It, yes. and, and I think that's – and I think that can be scary for people and it's uncertain ground. But when you are reading, there's a comfort in reading about the past and knowing that people have got through it because then you think to yourself, we can get through this. It's not maybe a conscious thought, but it's a comfort thought that as human beings, we have the capacity to endure. And that is something that people come back to and and tell me about time and again, which always surprises me, but, you know, or maybe it doesn't surprise me as much anymore is that the qualities of resilience and endurance that are within Maisie Jobs and her ilk um, are comforting to people. And it's almost, it, it, it makes, it, it, I think it, I don't know, but I think it perhaps makes people realize that they too can draw upon qualities of resilience and endurance. We can get through this, you know, you can, you just get through every single day. Um, through a difficult period, whether that's, you know, personal or more collective or whatever, that, you know, you you come out the other side of it. And I think in sort of the books in the middle of the series, you know, particularly, um, you know, coming through a a dangerous place um, and leaving everything most loved and then a dangerous place, then you it hasn't happened immediately, but it doesn't happen in a thing, you know, just like that. But Maisie endures. She comes through the dark place and uh, and is stronger for it. Um, and I think as you see uh, going into in this grave hour, just a little signal, you know, Priscilla takes her out and, and says, you know, and she's Priscilla, as we know, is a fashion plate. <laughs> and she's always trying to get Maisie to wear more color. And there's suddenly she's wearing a magenta suit or as they would refer to it in those days, a costume. You mm. never it, was, it wasn't referred to as a suit, you know skirt and jacket suit it was they referred to it as your costume my dad used that phrase right to the day he died oh it's a very nice costume you've got there love <laughs> <laughs> and language is really important too <laughs> so, definitely yeah, so um I think that's all <laughs> I think that's all so important and I think it is something I've definitely felt reading it. And you read things like this, like, oh, people went down into a bomb shelter, listened to the world being blown to bits, not knowing if the people they cared about were okay. And they came back up and they went to work. So if they've done that, well, then I suppose I can sit down this morning and and write some more words for my book. (laughs) You know, it makes you feel a little bit, I don't know, at least it made me feel like, oh, I must be terribly self-indulgent if I think that certain things I'm facing are difficult in comparison to, you know, two ounces of tea or whatever they had a week, you know, and they had that tea and then she had to get the special coffee and the whole thing with the drinks, you know, just trying to manage your energy level because you're so exhausted. Um, I think looking to history does help in the sense of like, there is a precedent for this and people have gotten through it. And I think that's something that's beautiful about books that they can give us is not just it's so much more than entertainment. I think it's it's a template in a way or a guidepost to to learn from somebody. And that's why I think all of those studies that talk about people learning to be empathetic through reading are, are really accurate. And I think also, um, you know, in story, and this goes right back to the myths and legends, we 
we almost and this is true of any writer, you cannot help but touch upon universal truths as you're developing a character. As you're you're like a master puppeteer putting your your characters through um, good times and bad. And and with that, particularly if you're drawing upon your own experiences in life, you know, you you cannot help but touch upon universal truths. It's like, you know, there's this that's the, the what goes to the heart of people. Um, even if you're writing comedy, you know, mm. you, you, you can't help it, you know, <laughs> I, and I, I think there's something that will always touch people, but I, I think, you know, particularly through the collective troubling times, you know, um, and it's why, for example, after, you know, the first world war, you never heard that generation talk about it in great depth because everybody was impacted, everybody um, you know, you, if you consider how people lived then very much, you know, you didn't have, you, you lived within a certain area and you grew up in that area. You probably married within that area and you settled within a given area. So when someone was lost in battle, it was as if everybody had lost that person. And actually the way just as an aside, the way um, they structured the army in the First World War, the chances were everybody in a certain street, every, all the young men in a certain street were, were killed on the same day. Um, mm. and, and so there was, a, there was a collective grief. So you didn't come out of it talking about, you know, your terrible experience because everybody else had had a terrible experience too, pretty much. Um, and, and, but nowadays that's, that's, you know, we have different, we have a different set of circumstances. And particularly in in America, where you know the, the I mean, America's gone through very difficult times, gone through uh, times of civil war and so on. But um, troops have often gone overseas to fight, rather than having war come to your doorstep as it has in Europe. And so there's there's uh, a, 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 a there's a the sense of loss is is not collective in the same way, although there are. There are obviously, you know, I mean, there are certain wars that really impacted the national psyche. Definitely. And I think that I think it's important that that experience is used. I mean, this is something I think that that Maisie as a character is is successful at doing is taking difficult experiences and transforming them into something valuable that's supportive to other people. She's able to sort of almost metabolize her, her difficult early experience. And then often later deploys, um, like a single comment referencing that she'd been a nurse so that she knows what it's like to, to lose mm -hmm. people or to see people die and that that helps her in her work. And I think that's something really valuable for people to remember is that if they've experienced something difficult, this can actually make you more valuable in life. And she's yeah. a great example of that. Always that old phrase, you know, what 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 doesn't kill you can only strengthen you. Yes, <laughs> you know, and I, I, this this uh, the, about her being a nurse. It's important to remember that she that was something that she did in a time of war at a young age. She lied about her age, as many young men did. You know, lied about their age. Well, many women lied about their ages as well. Um, but she was at an impressionable age, and she has never forgotten that experience has has defined so much of who she is and which is why she uh, and she also has that uh, if you will that caring gene as it were but any i think uh, here's an example um i think that of why i think that sort of experience is so profound in that it was after i'd published Maisie Dobbs i was at a um i, I did a reading and it was down in uh, san diego and after I'd talked about the book and done it, read a little bit, uh, you know, I signed some books and this was, you know, my first novel. I was, I mean, I have every, every single one of those events I did. I mean, I, you could actually see my blouse moving where my heart was beating so fast. I was so nervous. And, um, and there were these four women who just hung out behind uh, when everyone was gone and they came up to me and said, we really would like to talk to you about something that happened to us. And it was very, it was a very profound experience. It stayed with me, and I actually get choked up when I think about it because they explained that they had not known each other before they all be, joined the same book club, and it was in a certain area. And Maisie Dobbs was chosen as the book to read, and 
at the end of after they you know book clubs you know everybody has a glass of wine you get your salad and so on and you talk about the book and uh, and then you sort of move on to other things perhaps and one of the women said you know and and so this is hard for me to talk about but it had a profound effect on me because i was a nurse in vietnam and i've never been able to talk about it and then this other woman said me too and the other two and all four of them admitted and and began to talk about their experiences and to a person they had never been able to 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 talk about that experience because they had they felt they just it was so raw they could not talk about it so they had buried it and the four of them had become incredibly good friends because they had been able uh, and I guess inspired by story as people have been it's not just me as people have been inspired by stories since the earliest days of storytelling that's how I, people tell stories and it is to to find perhaps uh, you know there's that common ground and it really touched me and it was the profound experience of having seen death of a most terrible kind that you cannot talk to just anyone about because not just anyone has seen that and therefore does not necessarily understand because it's so hard to get your head around that really you can you can imagine it to a certain extent but to to truly get your head around that consistent experience of of uh, of 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 death is, I think is, is uh, in battle is, is really hard for other people that have not been in battle. And therefore there is an isolation of not only of the veteran, whether that veteran is a man or a woman or whatever their circumstances. That's amazing. (laughs) I think that's, I think that's one thing that I think about all the time is that when people are writing and they may be in a situation like you were thinking, oh, I have no idea. This book is just happening. I've got to tell this story. And so many times when people are writing, they think, oh, it doesn't matter if I finish this or not. Um, Oh, nobody cares about what I'm writing. It doesn't make any difference. And then you hear a story like this where these women would never have been able to talk about their experience had they not read that book. So it's so important. Yeah, I think there's always going to be someone that you can touch, which is why I think that that any writer should never just think, oh, I'm not going to finish this book. Who's going to to read it? It was shortly after Maisie Dobbs was published, and it was published in the UK after it was published here. I received a a letter from a a 94-year-old woman, and she told me her story, which was that her father – so I'm trying to think uh, how she would have been – but just after the First World War – you know, she was a little girl and her, it was in, I think she said it was when she was 11, her father committed suicide in the home and she had never understood why. He was a veteran of the First World War and he had seen, he'd been through all the big battles, Plug Street Wood, the Somme and so on. And he, she, she said, I never understood what, why he took his life. She said, I, I read your book and now I feel at peace because I understand why my father took his life. And I remember thinking to myself, if she's the only person that had ever read my book, it was worth it. Mm. It was worth it for that letter to put that away. It was, if, if you know, I'm thinking if another, if I don't get another reader in the rest of my life, I've, I, 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 I feel I've done something for one person. And, and, and that, I, I don't, oh gosh, I don't want to sound self-congratulatory there. But it, what it means is that, you know, if you're, you're a writer, you're a writer and you have a story to tell in whatever way you want to tell it, there is someone who will be touched by that story, someone who will be elevated by that story, someone who might get a great laugh out of that story if you're writing comedy and there's someone it will touch and it was, it's worth it. It's worth it. Even if, you know, I mean, not everybody has the good fortune to be published. Having said that, I think this is a golden age of being published because there are so many avenues available to you. But even if, you know, you join a writer's group and you read at an event or something and someone is touched by your story, then you have done a job of work. That's just something I believe. (laughs) I do too. I do too. And I'm so grateful that we've had the chance to talk to you today, Jacqueline. It's really been an honor. Well, it's been an honor for me. Thank you very much. And thank you for your insightful questions. 
Thank you for listening to the Secret Library Podcast. The show is produced by me, Caroline Donahue, and Frederick Barry McWilliams Jr., my tireless audio engineer. To get show notes for this episode and all other episodes, please visit secretlibrarypodcast.com. To get updates, literary love, and notification when new episodes are posted, sign up there for Footnotes, my newsletter. And to learn about life coaching with me to work on building your writing life, visit carolinedonahue.com. If you enjoyed this episode, please share it with a friend. Gold stars to everybody who leaves a rating and review on iTunes. We're so grateful. Until next time, happy reading.